chance they were going to have to stay in here with us, and that was not going to be a positive. <laughs> all right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see you this morning. Glad you all are here. And for those who were here yesterday with the three-on-three -three tournament, I hope you slept well last night. I know I certainly did. Out in the sun a little bit more, and uh, a little bit more energy expended than what my uh, normal Saturday might be. We're going to be in the book of Second Chronicles. If you take your Bible, please. Second Chronicles and chapter number 12. Second Chronicles, and we'll look at the 12th chapter here in just a moment. Second Chronicles and the chapter number 12. While you're turning, let me just say that it really is a privilege for us to be able to be here. We've actually been here since Thursday. On Thursday night, we started uh, revival services, kind of a different night to start on, but it's how it worked out for us and for the church and with our Saturday outreach event, which I'm sure more will be said about that here in the morning service. But um, we'll be here, of course, this morning, tonight, and then um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're going to have special services each night. So I don't know what your normal habit is on um, whether or not you usually come to special services, but we'd love to have you come every night this week. Every night, we'll be looking at what God's Word has to say. 7 o'clock, right, Pastor? Yes. So 7 o'clock, we'll be looking at what God's Word has to say. We'll, we'll, I'll have the, my, my uh, family will sing, and there will be special music and the congregational singing and everything. You'll enjoy the services. But the emphasis each night will be looking at what God's Word has to say and just a time where we can kind of set aside some of the stuff that we're normally involved in and get refocused and revived regarding those things which are eternally important and that the reason for which we are here. So uh, I'd like to invite you and encourage you to come if, you, if you're able to. Um, we'd love to have you. 2 Chronicles chapter number 12, and let's look together here in just a moment at verse number 13. This is 2 Chronicles chapter number 12 and verse number 13. The Bible says this, So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem, and he reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah, and Ammonitis. We'll stop right there. Father, help us please this morning in Sunday school to learn the things that we need to learn. Father, you know my inability to be able to do anything of any eternal value, but I believe that you give us a lesson here from this historical account that we need to get and it needs to sink into our minds and into our hearts. And in some cases, Father, perhaps it needs to change the direction that we're headed right now or the mindset that we have right now. And so, Father, please give me just exactly what needs to be said. Help me to be succinct and help me, please, to be clear in my speech and in the uh, truth that we see here in your word. I need your help, and I confess that, please. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask your help. Amen. Amen. Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you all know who uh, Roy Rogers is? <laughs> How many of you know Roy Rogers? Can I see it? Okay. So if you do... Most of you do not. If you don't have gray hair or no hair, you probably don't know who he is. But we in our family are Roy Rogers fans. Roy Rogers is oftentimes called the king of the cowboys. Back in the 40s and 50s, he made a bunch of cowboy movies and shows. And the thing about Roy Rogers, well, a couple things. He was a singing cowboy, and so I enjoy his music. And uh, Roy Rogers was always the good guy in all of his shows, all of his movies, always the good guy. And... Basically, if you saw one Roy Rogers movie, you know the plot for the rest of them because the plot was always, always, always the same. Basically, in essence, what would happen is at the beginning of the movie, Roy Rogers would be riding his horse Trigger and he'd be singing a song. All of a sudden, he'd hear a gunshot. He'd ride over to where the gunshot took place. There'd be a man lying on the ground and a bad guy, a bandito, running away on his horse. And so Roy Rogers would take out his gun and take a shot at the bad guy, but he misses him. Just as he finishes taking up and taking a shot and bends down over the guy that's on the ground, the sheriff of the town would ride up and he would say, Roy, I can't believe you shot this man. And Roy would say, I didn't shoot this man. There was another man. He shot the man. I came up. I tried to shoot him. And the, the sheriff would say, I'm sorry, Roy, but I've got to hold you because it looks like you're guilty of this. Then Roy would punch the sheriff, tie him up and say, Sheriff, I'm sorry to have to do this, but I have to prove my innocence. And the rest of the movie was Roy go, setting about to prove his innocence on, uh, in this whole situation. At the end of the movie, 
the sheriff would come and say, Roy, obviously you were you were not guilty. I'm sorry I ever doubted you. You're a good man, Roy, and we love you. And they'd catch the bad guy, and Roy would get the girl, and that would be the end of the movie, basically. So now, if you've never seen Roy Rogers, you've actually seen them all, all in a moment, as I explained it to you. That, that's, that is the uh, plot of each one of them. Now, in our family, we like Roy Rogers because the good guy always wins. Now, in today's time, we don't, we don't watch much TV or movies, but uh, in today's times, bad guys can be good guys, and good guys can be bad guys, and you never know whose side is on which, and it's confusing. But the simplicity of those days and the simplicity of the Roy Rogers movies, we enjoy because I like it when good guys win. Don't you? Yes. Don't you like it when just the good guy comes out? I mean, in real life. Don't you like it when you see a person that is good and they're successful? I mean, they're a moral person. They're a good person. Um, I'm not... I, I don't keep up with sports a lot as far as in the NFL or even college sports much at all. But several years ago, in Florida, there was a, uh, there was a ball player, a football player, who was not only a good football player, but he was a good person. He was a believer. And he was, he was outspoken in his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was consistent with what he claimed he believed, which is a fairly odd thing to find. You guys know who I'm talking about? Tim Tebow. Okay. Now, I'm not a Florida fan. Not at all. Uh, but I couldn't help but cheer for Tim Tebow to do well because he was a good guy. And you just want to see good guys succeed. When, when you hear about good people doing well, it just kind of makes you go, all right, huh, good. There's a little bit of justice in this world. The good guys are, are doing well. Well, in the book of Chronicles, this book chronicles or writes down for us uh, basically the lives of several of the kings of Israel. And the way basically that God lays out for us each of the lives of these different kings is he'll tell us in some cases a little bit about their life, some things that they did, and then at the end, it will tell you how long, the Bible will, the Bible will tell you how long they reigned, oftentimes what the name or who their mother was, and then the Bible will say whether that person, that king, did that which was right or that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, when I'm reading the book of Chronicles and I'm reading about these different kings, I can't help myself, but I, I find myself kind of cheering for the guy like, oh, please be a good guy, please be a good guy, please be a good king. Because I want to hear that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Like his father David did is usually how the Bible puts it. And not he did that which was evil. So here we have King Rehoboam. The Bible says, we just read the verse in verse number 12. I'm sorry, verse number 13. That he strengthened himself in Jerusalem. He was 1 and 40 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naaman and Ammonitus. And verse number 14 says he did... Evil. Evil. Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. And when I read that, I think to myself, oh man, he did evil. But I got to thinking to myself some time ago, I wonder why. Why did Rehoboam do evil? You know, there's coming a day for every believer that we're all going to stand before, every person will stand before God. But every believer will stand before God and either... I mean, those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ will we'll be in heaven. But i gotta, I got to tell you, when I get to heaven, I want to hear the Lord Jesus say to me, I want to hear the Father say to me, well done, good job, you good and faithful servant. In essence, I want to hear God say, hey, Tim, you did that with right in my sight. So when I read about a man like Rehoboam, and the Bible says about him that God's epitaph for this man was he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, I think to myself, okay, what did he do and how can I avoid it? What was, what was the issue for Rehoboam? Why is it that God said about him he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord? Well, somebody could say, well, perhaps it was because of his heritage. You know, if he had be had a better upbringing, if his family had been a better family, then Rehoboam would have done well. Well, for all you Bible scholars out there, um, and it's Sunday school, so you can answer out loud, okay? Um, 
Who was Rehoboam's father? Anybody know? Solomon. Well, no, Solomon. Solomon. Okay. And who was Solomon's Solomon. father? David. Okay, so we have Rehoboam, whose, whose dad is Solomon, and Solomon, whose dad is David. Solomon is, is written about in Scripture, and God says about Solomon, what, what, is, what is God's, uh, not epitaph, but what is, what is God's estimation, his summary of who Solomon was? I'll kind of give you a, a starting and then you finish it. He was the wisest, w w w wisest man that ever lived. Okay, so here's Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, and here's David, who was called by God a man after, his own heart. Okay, after God's own heart. So here, Rehoboam's family heritage is, he has a dad who is wise, he has a, uh, he has a father, or a grandfather rather, who is a man after God's own heart. And somebody can say, yeah, but Tim, Solomon and David, neither one were perfect. Well, let me ask you a question. Would that be true? Was Solomon perfect, yes or no? No. no. Was David perfect, yes no. or no? No, they, they weren't. That is true. In fact, Solomon was given wisdom by God, but he was given wisdom by God for the purpose of being a king. And he was a wise king. For what it's worth, he was a lousy father. But he was a wise king. He had wisdom. David, a man after God's own heart, David made mistakes, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But the summary of David's life was that he was a man after God's own heart. In fact, this morning I was reading about David just in some, just in some personal time with the Lord. I was reading about David and it struck me how God calls David his servant. And that's exactly how David saw himself. You know, Saul had the kingdom torn from him, the kingdom of Israel torn from him. But Saul, Saul never, he did not continuously see himself as a servant to God. He began to serve himself as king. But David, though he made some major mistakes, was consistently a servant to God. And when he, when he made a mistake, he would again recognize, Ah, your servant has failed, God, I've done wrong. And he'd come back to God as a servant. Here's Solomon who has wisdom. Here's David, a man after God's own heart. Not perfect, either one of them. But if there's ever anybody who should have the opportunity to do right, it would be the grandson of David and the son of Solomon because he has both wisdom that's been passed down. He has the heart. He saw that in his grandfather David. And some of that would have been passed down, especially in Solomon's early years. And Rehoboam would have seen this. But still, God calls Rehoboam, or says that Rehoboam did evil in his sight. That was the summary of his life, the epitaph of his life. Why? Why could that be? Well, the verse actually tells us. Look, look down again at 2 Chronicles chapter number 12. And look with me at verse number 14. And let's learn this. And let's see if we can avoid some of the things that Rehoboam went through. Verse number 14, the Bible says, And he did evil... Now look at this. Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Now for those of you who remember things better when you say them out loud, let's read it together, okay? Here we go. 2 Chronicles 12, 14. And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. One more time. Ready? Verse 14. And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Now, real quickly, let me just walk through Rehoboam's life that we have written about him. For some of you, you're familiar with his life already, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. When Rehoboam was going to be crowned king after Solomon died, the men of Israel, this would have been all 12 tribes, came together and they, in essence, said to Rehoboam, now again, I, in my mind's eye, what I see is uh, Rehoboam is at, is at the castle. He's at, he's at the house that his father built. And I always picture there being like a balcony that comes out. And so he's out standing on this balcony and there's the, there's the crown beside him. They're getting ready to anoint him to be the king and perhaps, perhaps a prophet or a preacher or somebody up there that's going to do it because that, that kind of thing would happen in Israel. And then all the men of Israel were gathered together and they come, they come together and the leaders of the men of Israel come to Rehoboam and they say, Rehoboam, look, your dad, he was a good king. He was wise. He, 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 had, he had it so that we had peace all around. But they said, Rehoboam, your dad, his hand was heavy. He taxed us heavily. And they said, we'll let you be king. We'll serve you as king. But you need to back off the taxes. 
Now, it's interesting to me that for thousands of years we've been complaining about basically the same thing. But here the men of Israel come to Rehoboam and they say, we'll serve you, you can be the king, but you need to back off. So Rehoboam said, give me three days and let me think about it and let me get some counsel. <clears throat> the Bible says that first, Rehoboam went to his father's counselors. Time out. Who are, who, who is his father? Solomon. Okay, and Solomon was the wisest. wisest man that ever lived. So, if the wisest man that ever lived had counselors, do you think they may have had some wisdom? Nope. Well, yeah. yeah. Here, they, here they are. They're, they are advising the wisest man that ever lived. And obviously, they, they, he would listen to their counsel. So, Rebone comes to them and he says, here's what the people have said. What should I do? And his father's counselor said, Rebone, listen to the people. Speak kindly to them. Back off the taxes. Get established as king. That's what's important here. And then the Bible says, sadly, that Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and he went to his own familiar friends. That is, he went to the people that he knew and he said to them, this is what the people have said. Now let me just stop. This is not the point of the passage or the message, but real quickly, let me just throw this in as an aside. Hey, look, counsel is good for all of us to get. All of us need counsel. All of us do. We're all going to run into things where we need counsel. Be thoughtful. Be biblical in where you get your counsel. So many times, especially, well, I, I think it's easiest to see in young people. Teenagers, young people will make lousy decisions because they get counsel from, from unwise places. Here's, here's a teenager. We don't have many teenagers in here, so I can pick on them, all right? Here's a teenager and a 16-year-old girl, and she's having trouble with mom. She and mom just aren't seeing eye to eye. And mom just doesn't understand her. And just doesn't, just doesn't, you know, her mom was raised way back in the 1900s, and this is the year 2000s, and so there's no way that her mom can possibly understand her, and they... They're just, they're just having trouble. So she needs, obviously, she needs help on what to do about mom. So, so what does she do? Well, obviously, what any teenager would do, you go on Facebook and you message and post and you Instagram to all of your friends who are 16-year-old who have problems with their mom and you find out from them what to do. All right, now, we adults in here sit and we go, duh. Not a good place. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a teenager having problems with mom and dad, you don't go to another teenager who's having problems with mom and dad in order to get counsel, do you? Nope. Because they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't have any more wisdom than you do. When I, when I was in college, uh, Brittany and I were engaged. I was a senior. We were engaged to be married. Brittany is the second girl that I ever dated. When I was in high school, I briefly I dated a girl for just a brief amount of time, and then Brittany was the only other girl that I ever spent any time with, and then we ended up getting married. So I was in, I was either a junior or senior in college, and I think I was a senior because because of who my roommates were. Um, I was a senior in college, and uh, Brittany and I were engaged, and she and I had had a disagreement about something. I don't, it wasn't, it wasn't anything big, but my brother was one of my roommates, and so I came back and I was telling him about something that had happened, and my freshman roommate was listening in on the conversation, and uh, he said, he said to me, he said after I got done explaining everything, he said, Tim, I can help you with this. <laughs> he says, I understand women. Well, first of all, if a man ever says that he understands women, you know that you can turn him off after that because there ain't no man that understands the way women think. But he said to me, I have had 14 girlfriends, so I know the way women think. So I said to him, you've had 14, I've had two, and I'm I'm engaged to the one that I that uh, is is my girlfriend now. I'm I'm engaged to her. You don't understand the way girls think. Not any more than I do. There's no way. What? Because you've been through 14 of them. You don't understand nothing, man. <laughs> You're seriously without knowledge about this. Okay. So it would be it would be silly to go to somebody who has who's had 14 girlfriends to find out how to deal with the problem when when I've only had one or two girlfriends. All right, you understand the, the way that thinks? Okay, so we adults obviously have learned this lesson and we don't struggle with this anymore. 
Well, except for when we run into something where sometimes the questions we have, we already have an answer in our mind of what we would like to hear. And if we went to certain people for counsel, we think the counsel they might give might be something different than what we'd like to hear. I don't know anybody's situation here, so please, please don't think anybody said anything to me or anything like that. I'm just shooting in the dark here, okay? Here's a husband and wife. They have difficulty. Things aren't going well in the relationship. They, they, there's just a little bit of stuff going on, and it's escalating. And so a husband or a wife goes to a friend who's been divorced or gone through a separation in order to get counsel on how to handle the situation. Now, it's not that God can't forgive, change, and teach lessons to people who have been... It's not, it's not a matter of God not being able to restore. That's not, that's not the point at all. It's just, if you, if you need counsel about something, you go to people that have been successful at what it is you need counsel about. You go to somebody who's lived their life based on the Bible about these things and get counsel from them so that, so that you have some wisdom. So here's where you bow him, and he goes to the, to the counselors of his father, the wisest king that ever lived, and he forsakes their counsel, and then he goes to his young familiar friends, and they tell him, in essence, hey, you need to make sure that everybody knows that you're the king. I mean, you, you need to let them know that you're the man in charge and ain't nobody going to tell you what to do. So three days later, he stands before the men of Israel. The men come and say, what's your answer? And Rehoboam says, <coughs> I'm the man. My father's thigh is not going to be as thick as my little finger. He scourged you with whips. I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. In other words, you think it's been bad before. You ain't seen nothing yet. You thought it was heavy before. <laughs> Just you wait. And the men of Israel said, fine, we're done. And they split that day. Ten of the tribes get up and they walk out and start their own nation. And, and now Rehoboam is left reeling. Well, the, left, the rest of Rehoboam's life is his, uh, his trying, trying to find his way as king, trying to patch this back together. He can't do that. Sometimes he'd listen to God and then he'd get prideful and arrogant, and he would live life his own way and refuse and reject God, and then he would get in trouble, and another king would come in and start to, uh, start to abuse the people. And so he'd come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and God would help him. And then you'd just have this cycle take place where he's serving God, and then he gets lifted up with pride and he lives for himself, and then God punishes, and it just continues on this cycle. And then you have the end of his life. At the end of his life, God says he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now listen, please, please don't miss this, because if you miss this, you'll miss the reason why we're having Sunday school this morning. He did evil, the Bible says, in giving us the summary, because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. The word prepared means to set. He did not establish. He never came to the place where he made the decision that for himself, he was determined that he was going to seek God. And he wasn't going to let anything else pull his attention off from that. He, he, had, he never came to a place where he determined. He lived a little bit off of the legacy of his father and certainly off of the mercy and legacy of his grandfather, but he never for himself made the determination that God is my God. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to obey him. I'm going to be his servant and I'm going to follow God regardless of what anything else, whatever else may happen. I'm going to be a servant and a follower of God. He never came to the place where he determined for himself and established his heart, where he set his face like a flint to serve God. And because, listen, because he did not set his heart to seek after God, the most natural thing in the world happened, and that is he wandered away from serving God. And when either success or failure came, he was tempted to leave, and he would leave off following God. And at the end of his life, God says, he did that which was evil, because he didn't prepare his heart to seek after me. Okay. It was not his heritage that determined whether or not he could serve God. He had a good heritage, but he didn't serve God. Friends, listen to me. Look, look, look. 
I don't know what your heritage is. I don't know what your background is. I don't know what your family life is like. But listen to me. Don't blame that. You cannot rest. You cannot look back at things that have happened to you in the past and let that be the determining factor. Let that be the justification for why you're not consistently serving and following after God. That, that's not the reason. The reason why, why we're not following God is because we never come to the place where we say, you are my God and I will follow you and by your grace and by your strength, I'm going to do the things that you say and I'm going to trust you and take care of everything. Rehoboam missed it. Rehoboam missed the opportunity to have God say about him, he did that which was right in my sight. And he missed it because he never set his heart to seek after God. Okay, so let me ask you, don't answer out loud, but think, please. I'm not asking whether or not you come to church or you're in Sunday school for crying out loud. I'm not asking if you have a good background, who your grandfather was, whether he was a preacher or a deacon. I'm not, I'm not asking what you used to do or how involved you used to be or how you used to serve God. I'm not asking that. But think. Have you come to the place, are you at the place right now where your heart is set? You're my God. I'll serve, I'll follow, I'll obey. You're my God. Have you prepared and set your heart to follow after God? To seek Him? Okay, now let me, let me let you in on something. That's the reason why we have weeks like this. Weeks where we have services. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and we have a Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday as well. Why? Well, because the pastor thought you guys weren't busy enough. And you didn't have enough going on in your life. And you were bored and listless and because no that's, that's not it obviously if you want a busy group of people you guys are it so why why go through all the trouble all the expense of a week like this why why do that well because all of us need help in setting our heart Amen. preparing right. our heart establishing that we're going to seek after God. Amen. And that's going to happen as we look at what God's Word has to say because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word, the Word, of, God. The Word of God. So we gather together and we set aside other things we come together for the purpose of reestablishing, resetting, and determining ah, He's our God. We're going to follow Him. We're going to serve Him. All right, let me let you in on another secret. That's why this church exists. That's why you have Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, why you meet together at Wednesday night, why you have outreaches, why you have opportunities to reach out to other people. All of that, all of that is involved in your having your heart set to seek after God. Why? Hey, hey, why? Because someday, someday, will stand before our Lord. And I certainly want to hear him say, hey, good job. Well done. Your good and faithful servant. Amen. Yeah. I'm telling you, at that point, at that point, the money I had in my pocket, the food I put in my belly, the hobbies I enjoyed, <clears throat> the acceptance of the people around me, all of that means absolutely nothing. It's wood, hay, and stubble. It, it's not that it's wrong. It's not that it's evil. It's not that God says don't enjoy those things. God gives us all things richly to enjoy, but all of it with the mindset of first and foremost, I'm established. I'm going to seek after God. And all I do, I'm seeking after God. So again, would, would you, answer, you might as well answer honestly because you're not going to answer out loud, just in your heart. And God knows your heart anyway, so you might, as well, you might as well be honest with yourself. Are you at the place now where you're set, you're established, you're determined? He's our God. 
He's my God. I'm serving Him. I'm following after Him. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. There's not, there's not much of anything that has more value than that. Okay. Now, if that's true, and it is, 30 or, or 45. 45. Okay. Um, if that's true, let me give you just real quickly, let me give you four practical suggestions in relation to this week, the, the time that we have together. Let me give you four practical suggestions for helping you prepare your heart to seek after God. Um, number one, uh, let me encourage you to uh, determine to attend the services this week. Determine to attend. That is, um, just play, if you're if you're able to, if you're physically able to come, then come to every service that you possibly can. I I'm not setting up a Pharisaical law of if you don't come, it's not it's not like that at all. All of this is think of it this way: Hey, we need to set our hearts to seek after God. I, God God has called me to the ministry of helping you with this. He's told me to tell you things. I have things from God for you. And so, come to the services if you can. Even if it's not your normal habit. Come tonight. Come Monday night. Come Tuesday night. Come Wednesday night. Just say, Brother Tim, um, I have things planned. Uh, Monday night, I have a show that I always watch. <laughs> now, I admit that those shows are very important. <laughs> Man, they have high value. I'm being a little bit facetious. If, if there's things that you have planned but you can set them aside, set them aside for crying out loud. Set them aside for the purpose of coming so you can hear what you need to hear so that you can live as God would have you live so that, he'll, so that you can enjoy the epitaph of He did that which is right in my sight. It's not, it's not that coming to church is necessary. It's not, it's not like uh, coming to church is he did that which was right because he came to church. No, no, no. We come to church to learn the things we need to learn and do the things we need to do so that God will say that he did that which was right. So just determine that you're going to. If you, if you wait until half an hour before the services begin this week to decide whether or not you're going to come, all things being equal, you ain't coming. These chairs are comfortable but they're not quite as comfortable as the Lazy Boy recliner in your living room. <laughs> I get that. I know that. Um, we'll do our best in um, providing music that will be enjoyable, that will be a blessing to your heart. I'll, I will do my best to preach with energy and to use stories and things that will help keep your attention. I'll do all that. But as, as tr try as I may, I will probably not be as entertaining as something you could flip on and watch on TV. That I, I acknowledge that. I admit that. It's not, it doesn't quite feed the uh, amusement, the without thinking of sitting down and watch, watching something. I'm, I'm going to ask you to think this week. That is true. But I'm telling you, I want, I want you to set your hearts to seek after God. So just determine to attend. And by the way, secondly, when you come... Um, decide to listen. That is, come, but come with a heart that's ready to receive what God has for you. Um, come with a mindset of, God, I, I'm needy. There are things I need. Feed me, show me, teach me. Rebuke me if necessary. Show me areas where I'm not doing what's right and, and help me, God. Give me what I need. And uh, if you come with that heart ready to receive, well, what a difference it will make. Thirdly, why don't you carve out some time to ask God to speak to you? Yeah. Take time every day. This, this week, just a few minutes, and in sincerity, just say to God, God, I need. God, I want to draw close to you. I want my heart to seek after you. God, please speak to me. And did you know that that's a prayer that God would love to answer? Yes. The Bible says if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us, and if He hears us, we know that we have the thing for which we ask. Do you think it's according to God's will to have Him speak to your heart and have you draw closer to Him? Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course it is. So if I know that that's something that God wants and I ask Him about it, don't you think He will? Yes. 
So you mix the asking God and then coming with a heart ready to receive, eager. Hey, by the way, there are practical things you can, you can do with this. If it helps you to remember things and take notes, then write things down. Sometimes it helps you to be more engaged in what's being said if you'll, if you'll write things down and you, you come with the intent of learning something. I was, I was uh, chuckling to myself on the inside today when I, I just played a scenario. I don't know if you ever played scenarios, but I was playing the scenario of people coming up um, and coming to church and not, not wanting to stay, so they're leaving. And then my saying something along the lines of, hey, I'm sorry you're leaving today because today I was showing, I, I found a secret in the Bible about how you could, how you could turn your, your uh, <coughs> financial situation around just like that. I found a secret in the Bible how within 30 days you could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're making. I'm wondering how many people would say, oh, well, in that case, I'll think I'll stay. You know, if you have something that has interest to you, then you'll come. Not only will you come, but you're like, yeah, I'm writing notes, man. There ain't no way I'm missing out on this because this has some high value to it. All right. Now, please. The value of our coming together, hearing God's word so that we can set our heart and seek after God so that God will say to us, well, done good job you did right in my sight but that's valuable yeah, that's right that has some significant eternal mm -hmm. value so uh ask god ask god to speak to you and then lastly um dedicate your resources that is invest yourself and when i say that i'm not primarily speaking about financially that wouldn't be appropriate for me to do and i wouldn't i wouldn't do it even if it was i don't need to but I mean invest, invest time and energy. Look, the more you put into something, the more you'll get out of it. Did you know that God could use you this week to bring somebody who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ to a service? They could hear the gospel. God's spirit could convince them of their need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. They could be saved and added to the church. And that could happen this week. Yeah. If you invest yourself in the ministry and the working of this church and of this week, this week will have more value to you and the messages will mean more to you. You're going to invest prayer because you have, you have an investment in this. You're investing your time, your energy. Make some phone calls. Pray for some people. Uh, go visit some folks and invite them to come. You have friends that owe you a favor. This is the time to collect, man. Get them here. Get them here to come and hear God's word. And I don't, I'm don't. i not suggesting at all that you do a bait and switch. We don't believe in that. In other words, it's not, hey, come because they're going to do music. And then, oh, they get here. Oh, by the way, they're going to be preaching too. No, 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 no. Shoot straight with them. You don't need to be embarrassed about the fact that we're going to look at God's word. We're talking about how to have eternal peace here. We're talking about how to know God. This is something that has high value for anybody who has any ears to hear at all. So invest in the week. Invest in and inviting people, invest in the effort of the week. Get on board and help. Don't be, listen, don't be someone who sits on the sideline who says, well, it's right for me to go to church, so I'll go to church. Because that's what God says to do, uh, so I'll do it. And that's it. Oh, mercy alive. What a terrible way to live. That's not setting your heart to seek after the Lord, and it's not going to help you to set your heart to seek after the Lord. Invest yourself. Determine to come. Determine to listen. Dedicate your resources. Take some time to talk to the Lord about it. And allow God this week to speak to your heart in such a way so that you can seek after God. Because someday all of us are going to stand before God. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Let's be faithful to who He is and to what He's called us to. May our hearts be established to seek after the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would drive the truth of what we should be learning from the life of Rehoboam and his mistakes so that we don't make the same mistakes, so that our lives are um, pleasant to you, beneficial to others, but most of all, God, 
that, that we would establish our hearts to seek after you so that we could hear you say someday, well done, good job, he did that which was right, she did that which was right in my sight. We love you, Father, we need your help. Now help us in the morning service to learn the things we need to learn and grow as we need to. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Mm -hmm. All right, dismissed until the morning service.